We're good. Okay, are we good? I guess it's time I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, roll call. Chris Mead. Chris Mead. John Mueller. Ron Kerr. Mike Carl. Jim Jack, city planner. Brandon Droff, city manager. Okay, looks like we've- Doreen, got... oh. I'm here via oh, I'm Zoom. Sorry. I am so sorry. I no worries. I should have recognized that there'd be somebody hanging out there in the ether, otherwise known as the internet. So nice of you to join us, Doreen. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would say public comments and items not on the agenda. Anything from the public audience that you would like to have that, you know, nothing that we're going to be talking about tonight. Anything, Scott? Okay. Well, then I guess before we launch into our public hearing, looks like we have a new person who has joined us. So uh, shall we do a brief introduction? And then we'll get, we'll do a brief introduction. What then we'll do you want to know? Down and then we can... uh, I'm Chris Mead. Uh, we've lived here for a year. We live uh, up in the new Holton subdivision. Uh, I work for Portland General Electric. Um, prior to that, I worked for Home Depot for three years. And prior to that, I had 30 years in law enforcement at CA Candy. Okay. And my name is Ron Kerr. I'm the Planning Commission Chair. I've lived in Lafayette since 2005 and have served on the Planning Commission since that point in time. And I'm, I currently work for the Oregon Department of Transportation. And uh, let's see, what else would you like to know about me that would be interesting? Now, let's assume we have an interesting life. So, <laughs> no. John Miola, I've been living in Lafayette since 2020. That for a moment because it was the beginning of COVID for everybody here. I worked for a winery out in Dayton called Dominion Broy and working for wineries for a very long time now, about 15 years now. So I'm Mike Carl. I've lived here since 2010. I've been on the on the commission for the last 12 years. I'm retired postal service and Enjoying my retirement. Jim Jacks, I'm the city planner. I work at the Mid Willamette Valley Council of Governments, and one of the things we do provide planning services to 22 small cities in Marion, Oak, and Yamhill counties. And I am the planner assigned to Lafayette, and I uh, started working at the Council of Governments in 2008. And Lafayette was one of the cities assigned to me. So I've been here as the planner for however many years that is. I'm Brandon, um, uh, new city administrator. Spoke with a few of you uh, already. Um, excited to be here. Um, came from Kansas before this. Um, I, uh, I know we have a lot of great work ahead of us. So I thank you for your service to uh, the community and to the council. And um, I think we're going to have a great working relationship. Good. And Doreen? Uh, yeah, I've, I've lived here since 2015. I've spent most of my career working in the film and television industry as a, an artist. And I currently run a 501c3 nonprofit here in Lafayette. Okay. Well, then tonight it looks like we have a public hearing and we have, I guess, two public hearings in reality. One uh, major minor variance. Uh, looks like application MAJVAR 2023 and then a subdivision application, sub 202201. So 
I guess at this point in time, we will yeah, open the start. oral statement changes there, one for the subdivision and one for the variance. So we're doing the variance first. So we'll go with the variance. There it is. Okay. Let's see if we can get through this. If somebody needs to nod off, let me know. I'll try to keep this from being too boring. Good evening. My name is Ron Kerr. I'm the Planning Commission Chair. I'll be presiding over the hearing tonight. Public hearing is now open. This is the time and the place set for the public hearing in the matter of case number VAR 2023-01, a major variance regarding the percentage of side yard airage that can be covered by an accessory structure and a minor variance to allow the accessory structure to be 1.2 feet higher than the primary dwelling at 1104 East 3rd Street. Oregon land use law requires several items to be read into the record at the beginning of each public hearing. The city planner will read the material. Your patience is appreciated as the statements are read. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the applicable criteria upon which these cases will be decided are found in the Lafayette Municipal Code, section 3.104.06 for minor variances, and section 3.104.07 for major variances. The specific criteria are addressed in the staff report and will be summarized during this hearing. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward the criteria or other criteria in the plan or land use regulation, which you believe to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issues precludes appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the decision makers to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. For the parties, if you have an audience, anyone testifying, if you have any documents, maps, or letters that you wish to have considered by this body, they must be formally placed in the record of this proceeding. To do that, either before or after you speak, please leave the material with the recorder who will make sure your evidence is identified and placed in the record. The hearing will proceed with a staff report followed by the applicant and those in support of the application. Then the opponents will be allowed to testify then those who are neither uh, in favor or against the application. <clears throat> the commissioners or staff may question the applicant. The applicant will be given an opportunity to rebut the testimony or evidence. Prior to the conclusion of the hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence or testimony regarding the application. If such a request is made, it will be up to this body to determine if the hearing will be continued to a time and date certain, or if the record will be kept open for submission of written evidence or testimony. If the record is kept open, it will be for a minimum of seven days with a short rebuttal period thereafter afforded to the parties and a short rebuttal period thereafter afforded to the applicant. Thank you, Jim. Uh, need to ask the audience that's out there. Uh, do any of you have any objections to the notice that was sent out in this case? Are there objections to the jurisdiction of this commission to hear and decide on the cases before us? I will take the silence to be uh, a response of no in both cases. Now for our counselors, are there any declarations of ex parte contact with either the applicants? Are there any declarations of bias or any conflicts of interest that you foresee as a council member in hearing this? No. Okay, no. Marine? No. Okay. And okay, it looks like we're now ready to hear the staff report. Jim, I'll let you take it. And oh, by the way, I, I, I appreciate you wanting to try to vote me to be mayor, but no, I, I don't think I want that vote. <laughs> So uh, this spring case includes two items mentioned at the beginning when Rod was speaking 
the first page of the staff report, uh, about two thirds of the way down, one of the items is a request. And so the major variance, and I guess I should back up, just provide a little bit of background. A variance is a request where there's standards in the development code. And if one of those standards cannot be met, then a safety valve, so to speak, is the applicant requesting that whatever is required be varied or waived. And so in this case, when you have a major variance, that means you're needing the standard change more than 20%. A minor variance is where it would be changed less than 20%. In this case, getting back to the first page, a major variance to allow an accessory structure to cover more than 20% of the 470 square foot east side yard. <laughs> and a main minor variance to allow the 12.3 foot high accessory structure to be 1.2 feet higher than the 11.1 .1 foot height of the primary dwelling. So if you take a look, just to kind of get oriented on page three, There is the site plan. At the bottom of the site plan is 3rd Street or 99W. On the left side is a driveway going into the property. The driveway swings around in front of the house and goes on around to the back of the house. But behind the house, the terrain drops off significantly. And behind uh, to the uh, west left, and off to the back, there is a creek that's deeply incised into the overall level of the terrain. <clears throat> and there is a significant amount of riparian vegetation along the creek corridor. So the basic issue is with this property, even though it's fairly large, the front of it where the house is and where this accessory structure is proposed to be located is up on the so to speak, normal level of the property. And then the property drops off quickly just behind the house. And rather than trying to build accessory structures such as this one down on the slope or down in the creek bed, then the proposal is put it up near the house where the house is located on that relatively flat upper area. So <clears throat> to find an area for this structure, Basically, the only suitable area is to the right or east of the house. And based on the site plan, there's a figure in the upper right corner of the site plan showing that the closest that the uh, accessory structure would come to the east property line is, uh, what is it, five and a half feet, basically. The required minimum setback is five feet. So the setback is met, that's not an issue. But in the code, it says in these side yards from the side of the house over to the side property line, a, an accessory structure should not occupy a large portion of that. And so the applicant, as you can see, is having to place the structure in to take up quite a bit of that Eastern side yard. And on page one, the amount is 83% of the east side yard. And then the back end, the L portion of the building, uh, I'm not sure that the applicant uh, has decided what to use it for, but in the application materials, it could be for storage, it could be for a music room or any number of things. Uh, the applicant is here tonight, Walter Jaquist, and we can find out more about exactly what might be in the northern part of the accessory structure when he testifies. So that is that. And for the east side yard, the building height, uh, basically the house is 11.1 uh, .1 feet high to the ridge. This structure is proposed to be 12.3 feet high to the ridge, roof ridge. And that's because the uh, garage portion of the structure would be for an RV. And it's not a 
low RV. It's a taller RV, needs a high overhead door to get in and out. So that's why the height is proposed to be as high as it is. And one of the issues is, well, does it have a real steep roof that's causing it to be as high as it is? And no, it's a, I forget what the pitch is, it's something like a 312 pitch, which is relatively flat compared to, well, in the last 20 years, an awful lot of houses have very steep roofs. And uh, the existing house does not have a steep roof. It's more like a 60s or 70s kind of a ranch style. And those all had a fairly low 3 and 12, 4 and 12 pitch. And so the uh, accessory structure is proposed to have that same kind of a pitch. So that's the request. And I've kind of jumped beyond the request to cover quite a few things. But uh, going on to page three, then <clears throat> at the bottom is where each of the uh, eligibility criteria are listed. And I don't intend on dwelling on these because you have the staff report for a week and have had time to go through it. But in, before a person can apply for a variance, starting at the bottom of page three, uh, the proposed variance uh, cannot allow a use that's not allowed in the district. Well, the applicant is not proposing to have some use that's not allowed in the zoning district, so that's okay. And I uh, cannot apply for a variance. If there's another procedure that is specifically listed, available to modify the standard. There is no other route. You have to do a variance. And then down to page four, the modification of the requirement or standard is prohibited. The district that the property is in does not prohibit variances. The last eligibility criteria is an exception from the requirement or standard allowed in the district. And again, there's nothing in the district that prevents the variance from being requested. So we move on, and then the individual criteria are addressed. Each one is listed, and there's an explanation as to how that is met. And it goes on over for a couple of pages, and then to the bottom of page six is the staff recommendation. And the staff Recommendation is that the major variance and minor variance be approved. And then typically as we have in our that reports on page seven, there's uh, three things that the commission can do. It can approve or it can deny or it can continue the hearing or leave the record open. And certainly another item is as part of approving it, you might in your deliberation find a additional reason to approve it, or you might find that there is some issue that is of concern and would develop a condition of approval so that it would be approved subject to meeting a condition of approval. As recommended by staff, there are no conditions of approval recommended. So with that, I'm going to leave that. If you have any questions, we can entertain those or move on to the applicant's testimony. The questions on our part, so uh, questions. We'll, we'll move on to the applicant's testimony. That may bring up questions or it may not. And when you come up, uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you. <clears throat> well, my name is Walter Jacquez. Um, my address is 1104 Third Street, Lafayette. <laughs> uh, I guess to start out, uh, I tried real hard not to come to this point. Um, <laughs> we played with different scenarios and different, take up the whole backyard. Can we put it down the hill? Not really. Um, we played with a lot of different, can we add on to the house? That was a huge can of worms. Um, really, this is, this is my good option. This is the only option that makes this project possible. And the, the thing about it is that that side of the house over there is a big expanse of flat gravel that right now just tends to collect junk and I'd really love to get that mitigated. Um, I, I, I want the stuff that's over there to be inside and not outside. And, uh, 
it's it's wet around here. I don't know if you guys have noticed. <laughs> um, so uh, here I am. Um, any? Do you guys have any questions for me? Will the will the new structure appear to be similar to to the original house? Yes. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm going to. I we matched the road pitch. It's actually five twelve. It's it's again pretty standard for older stuff. That that's an older house. Um, we're in the process of, of doing a lot of work on the house itself. And that's actually gonna be a separate thing, but a part of this project as well. Um, we, we went back and forth along the, um, for a long time whether we were gonna stay here or move someplace else and build a place. And we finally decided we're gonna stay. And so, yeah, we, we will have uh, the same type of siding. We will have a paint. It's, it's all gonna, that will all be done. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna look very much like the the place does now. When we're done with it. I have nothing else. Only question that I only comment that I have a question I might be and Jim, you might be able to answer this as well. Between the house and the structure that you're building. It's just a little over four feet. Now it's an accessory structure, so it could theoretically run that next to the house. But given its use, is there anything about fire code, like firewall or anything like that? People will need to be aware of or would, would want to be kind of stuff. Now the the some code does not have a separation requirement between an accessory structure and the house. That then leads it to the building code, which I'm not an expert at. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of accessory structures that are built closer to a house than you might think it would be reasonable. But um, the building code requires, for example, the wall of the garage next to the house to be a two hour rated firewall, then that's what will have to be built. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, for this structure, that four and a half feet will be a concrete. It's the walk. It's how you get to the back. Right. The yes. Yeah. 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 I can see you got a door there. It looks like going. You know, basically you walk straight back and you walk into the door into the yes. media room or the, the the new junk storage here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yes, I, I I I totally get it. Okay. So we don't have any questions it looks like everything is laid out and clear so i suppose at that point would be uh thank you very much thank and you. then opening it up for any any comments from people that are in support of said project will there be a neutral comment period too yes there will okay <laughs> there is we're, we're getting there yeah, we'll go for support. I might note in the oral statement that I had to read, and admittedly it's easy to kind of zone out on that, but it says the hearing will proceed with the staff report followed by the applicant and those in support of the application. Then the opponents will be allowed to testify, then those who are neither in favor or against the application. So to answer your question, yes, there will be. I've, I've just I've gone from the applicant into a support and then since there are no hands and people running to the podium to mow it over, uh, we'll go for anyone in the audience that is opposed to this particular project. Opponents? Okay, we have no opponents. Well, now we get to those that are neither for nor against. So the podium is yours, kind of, sir. Uh, Travis Johnson, 1002 Market Street. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Jaquith family for choosing to remain in town and make an improvement on the home, especially on our Highway 99W um, 3rd Street coming into town. Um, so um, thank you for that investment in the future of the community. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we have all of our testimony at this point. Uh, we'll enter deliberation. And if you have any other questions, and if not, then you can close the hearing and then deliberate to a motion. Okay. I have one question. Okay, you have a question. Uh, 
it's been a while since we talked about the urban renewal district. Does that have any effect on this location? Oh, the urban renewal district that just came into or that's coming into being. Correct. Correct. Well, depending on what the projects are in the urban renewal plan, this property may be in, its value may be improved if one of the projects is improvements to Highway 99W. But uh, there's probably no projects that would fund this garage or <laughs> do anything like specific to improve this property. Okay. Answer your question? They did. Okay. Well, then I will close the hearing. And then we can deliberate and come to a decision. Your thoughts, Chris? Um, I'm right. I mean, I'm willing to make a motion. We can move to that unless you guys want to deliberate more. Than we jump to that, or do we have to deliberate? Uh, we don't. Hey, deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, we kind of read it and looked at it, going, it, it, it's well laid out, well thought out. I, I certainly mm -hmm. appreciate and understand the applicant's position of they've tried many different ways to come up with a solution. And sometimes that simple solution is I need to go before the planning commission and I need to ask for a major variance. Yep. That's going to actually give me the best overall long term result. Totally get it. So, no, if you want to make a motion, then go for it. I'll make a motion. I move the planning commission approve the application, adopt the findings to support an approval. Or I, I move the application and adopt the findings to support an approval for the said application for the property. I will second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any all of, any opposed? No opposed. Okay, motion passes. So, thank you, John. And you can stay for the subdivision hearing if you want. You have a whole other more important thing to do than to you know, have no. to Like if you're just burning to waste it. I mean, I mean, kill it. I mean, join us for the evening. Sorry, guys. Thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome. <laughs> that takes care of that one. The variants. Now comes the biggie. Okay. On to another exciting case here in the big town of Lafayette. Good evening. My name is Ron Kerr. I'm the Planning Commission Chair, and I'll be presiding over this hearing again. The public hearing is now open. This is the time and place set for, for the public hearing in the matter of case number SUB 2022 01, a six lot 0 0.84 acre subdivision in the 800 block of North Jefferson Street. Oregon land use law requires several items to be read into the record at the beginning of each public hearing. This is why we're doing this again. The city planner will read the material. Your patience is appreciated as the statements are read. Thank you. Thank you again. And it'll be the same as was just heard for the prior case, other than we'll refer to the approval criteria for students and the R2 district, the zone that the subdivision is in, instead of the approval criteria for a variance. So the applicable criteria upon which this case will be decided are found in, in the Lafayette Municipal Code sections 2208 for land divisions and 2103 for the R2 district. The specific criteria are addressed in the staff report and will be summarized during the hearing. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward the criteria or other criteria in the plan or land use regulation, which you believe to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the decision makers to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. 
for the parties, if you have any documents, maps, or letters that you wish to have considered by this body, they must be formally placed in the record of this proceeding. To do that, either before or after you speak, please leave the material with the recorder who will make sure your evidence is identified and placed in the record. The hearing will proceed with a staff report followed by the applicant and those in support of the application. Then the opponents will be allowed to testify. Then those who are neither, neither in favor or against the application. The counselors or staff may request the applicant, or excuse me, the commissioners or staff may question the applicant. The applicant will be given an opportunity to rebut the testimony or evidence. Prior to the conclusion of the hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence or testimony regarding the application. If such a request is made, it will be up to this body to determine if the hearing will be continued to a time and date certain, or if the record will be kept open for submission of written evidence or testimony. If the record is kept open, it will be for a minimum of seven days with a short rebuttal period thereafter, according to the parties, and a short rebuttal period thereafter, according to the applicant. Thank you. Now, I need to ask the audience, are there any objections to notices that were sent out in this case? Everybody got sufficient notice. Are there any objections to the jurisdiction of this commission to hear the case and make a decision on it? Silence to both uh, will be interpreted as a no. Okay, for us, counselors, are there any declarations of ex parte contact, bias, or conflicts of interest by any members of the council? None by myself? None by myself. No, no. No, no. Okay, so. Well, we're now ready for the staff report, Jim. Okay, thank you again. So and, uh, we have two staff reports, one that was sent out a week ago, and that was based on the original uh, tentative plan and other plan sheets. And uh, in the ensuing week, there are good discussions between the applicant and the staff, and the applicant uh, submitted revised plan sheets. And so uh, it was that staff report, the revised plan sheets, and then an addendum that uh, came out yesterday. And the addendum then addresses the updated revised plan sheets. So all of these things are entered into the record. That is the original staff report with its plan sheets, the addendum staff report with its plan sheets, the applicant's uh, application form that was filled out, and a couple other uh, sheets that were with that. Also entered into the record are the city engineer's comments. And although I would comment, and you probably realized from reading the staff reports that the city engineer's comments are quoted in the staff report. So I'm not going to use the original staff report because it's so to speak, out of date. I'm going to use the addendum staff report and it essentially covers everything that the original staff report covered, but it is updated in terms of the updated nine sheets of material that were provided by the applicant. Um, uh, I guess to reiterate, it's a less than an acre, 0.84 acres, and the number of lots is six. It's a what often called an infill subdivision, infill development, because there's development all around it. And so if this were out on the edge of town, it would be a little easier to understand and so forth. But this one, the subject property is in town and right on the edge of the original 1850s or so town plat before the state of Oregon even existed. And so uh, we have Jefferson Street and I look at page two on the addendum staff report and that's a reproduction of the applicant's 
what's called the subdivision plan. And so at the bottom, there's 8th Street that runs east-west, and then Jefferson Street that sticks up north, and it only sticks up 100 feet, and then that right-of-way stops. And then that's where the south property line of the subject property begins. I guess I would note that when we were looking at the original staff report, there was an air photo on page two, and it shows the location and how it matches up with the north end of the Jefferson Street right of way. So in the addendum again, what is shown by the applicant is that there would be an extension of public right of way from where the Jefferson Street current right of way stops. And the extension of that right of way would be on the west side of the subject property. The uh, right of way stops where it stops. And then this property kind of covers over a little more than half of the right of way, something like 35 feet out of the 60 foot wide Jefferson Street right of way. So roughly uh, the western 27 feet of the subject property is to be dedicated as right of way all the way up to the north property line. And then within that would be a public street. And then on page three, it shows that public street. There's kind of a shading to show the asphalt and a dark, darker shading to show a public sidewalk on the east side. And in the section, in the 100 feet of the existing <laughs> right of way, the uh, city engineers recommended condition of approval and the uh, and the staff reports recommended condition of approval is that there be a 34 foot curb to curb and what's called curb to curb improvement. That means curb on each side pavement or two travel lanes. And in this case, there'd be enough space for parallel parking and then the sidewalk. And then the improvement as it gets onto the subject property uh, narrows down to a 28 foot curve to curve, which was one of the options the city engineer's comments included with a five foot sidewalk on the east side. And on page three, you'll notice that right of way and the street improvement at the north, it starts to bend to the east. And that is because tax lots to the west and then in the staff report, it specifically calls out tax lot 3813 which is kind of northwest kitty corner, uh, that tax lot is where it is. And if that right of way did not bend, the right of way would be pointing straight up and would impact the back end of tax lot 3813. And so uh, to not affect tax lot 3813, the right of way is bending to the east a bit. And then that also starts to get it lined up to the north end. Uh, the, sub the property abutting to the north of the subject property is tax lot 3000. And at the north end of 3000, there's a street, Adams Street, that abuts or is stubbed to tax lot 3000. So the idea is to have, even though it'll sound a bit odd, but have Jefferson Street eventually sometime in the future connect to Adams Street. They're physically lined up pretty close. We just need to have this development do what it needs to do to allow that connection to happen in the future. And then that is part of the reason why Another condition of approval is to have a public water line and a public sewer line go up to. Can we see that context. Well, we need to have it right up to the record. It's one of those things where <laughs> whatever they get 
everybody needs to see it and be able to comment about it. You yeah, know, that if they yeah. have some quirky thing about it that somebody wants to comment about them, they would have the opportunity to do that. Um, I guess if you're... Uh, I, 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 think he, I think he was show, trying to show me a map that was on this picture. All you're getting at and what he's getting at is that this is being laid out to allow Jefferson Street to proceed north, ultimately tying to Adams on that north edge, which is just at the top edge of the picture at some future point. Yeah, and and that's it. So in the original staff report, this color your photo with approximate property lines in yellow. When you go to the north property line of tax lot 300, in the northwest corner, there's a number in green, 4300. Now, don't worry about what that number completely is, but just to the left of the four is where Adam Street stubs. Right. So, so that allows you good. that Jefferson and Adams pretty much already line up. And so the effort with this six lot subdivision is to do what we can to allow that connection in the future. We don't know what might be built on tax lot 3000, but we're going to not throw us off options with this decision. Rather, we're going to allow for options in the future. So anyway, um, kind of getting back to the rest of the things, it's public water line in Jefferson, public sewer line, and then uh, Kind of in the middle of the property, off to the east, is a 20 foot, 25 foot wide easement that would <laughs> provide the driveway access to lots one through six. And in that easement, there would be a public sewer line. And that way, each of the lots can have a typical sewer lateral from the house to the public sewer line in that easement area. <laughs> and that sewage would flow westerly to the sewer line in Jefferson, and then that would flow southerly down to a manhole at the intersection of Jefferson and 8th. So everything with the water and sewer should be working okay. Uh, in terms of the water, uh, the conditions of approval do not recommend or require a public water line in the easement because Water lines are a lot smaller. Individual service lines to homes are a lot smaller than individual sewer lines to homes. And in that easement, it would be possible for a water line, a private water line from each of the lots to run westerly in the easement to the public water line in Jefferson. And those private lines would be installed in accordance with the Oregon special or the plumbing specialty code. Um, I, uh, one other thing is uh, the 28 foot wide easement or excuse me, improvement uh, would extend just a little bit past the west property line of this property. And it is extending over there because, and this is described in some detail in the original staff report. There was a 1979 easement granted from the north end of Jefferson Street, northerly uh, 177 feet, I think was the distance, something in that nature. And so those property owners that did that back in, what was that, 30, 40 years ago, they apparently were thinking that at some time in the future, when that hill up there was developed that Jefferson Street could be extended and there would already be a 60 foot wide easement for Jefferson to be extended in that easement. And so the eastern part of the property to the west, and that's tax lot 2900. So the eastern, whatever, 25 feet or so of 2900 is already encumbered by an easement and that easement is for roadway and public utility purposes. So the improvement that would be part of this subdivision would be slightly over onto the east portion of 2900. And it would be in the easement there. The easement allows roadway and utilities. 
Um, so anyway, that is a description of what the overall project is. The majority of the staff report then is talking about each of the approval criteria. In the original staff report, there was an issue early on, page maybe five or six, about the lot to width ratio. Uh, typically, zone codes have a standard so that you don't end up with real skinny, long lots. So the length of a lot cannot exceed more than whatever the width of the lot is. In the uh, Lafayette code, a lot cannot be longer than three times the width of a lot. And in the original, the southeast lot, parcel three, was just a hair short of that. And so there was a finding saying that parcel three did not comply with that standard. And there was a condition of approval requiring that things be adjusted to ensure parcel three complied with the lot width to depth standard. In the revised, that has been taken care of. So parcel three complies. We don't need a condition of approval requiring that it comply. Uh, in terms of emergency access, the improvement in the Jefferson Street right of way has the easement off to the east and that intersection is sufficient for uh, emergency vehicles to be able to drive up and back around and come back out, or if they were going to drive up and head in to the easement and then back around. So the Oregon Fire Code sets forth what the minimum dimensions are for those kinds of turnarounds and what is proposed meets or exceeds those dimensions. Um, and I know there's a lot of writing here. The findings are fairly detailed in many cases, but uh, I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, trying to think what else. Uh, I guess there's nothing significant that would need to be mentioned. I would say that, uh, and I'm going to jump to page 31 in the addendum. The last page or the last sheet. Uh, the property used to be owned by the city and it was sold. And in the sale agreement, one of the requirements was that when this property is developed, there be a fence erected along what ends up being the north, east, and south sides, I guess. Anyway, uh, so condition of approval number 25 basically just says consi consistent with the purchase and sale agreement between the city who is the former owner of the property and the current owner there's to be a six foot high fence installed along the side and backyards of the properties in accordance with the agreement and so that is just an extra little wrinkle that typically wouldn't be there necessarily, but often is in a subdivision where when a city approves a subdivision they require the perimeter property lines all be fenced to provide a green to the abutting properties. So I'm going to stop with that and we can hear from the applicant and then if there's questions so forth, we can get to those whenever we need to. So oh, applicant, oh applicant, for our town. Take your name and address. Everybody, uh, Ed Christensen, Welcome Engineering. Thank you. Two five two six zero Southwest Parkway Avenue, Suite G in Wilsonville. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is a tough design. I've designed over six thousand lots in my career that have been built. That's roughly the size of Sherwood. Um, <clears throat> this had a lot of challenges and I just am so appreciative of staff that we jumped through hoops. They did the hula hoop thing. They won the contest. And just coming up with, with um, 
a uh, revised staff report and the amount of time that they did and to um, bring up the questions that they had and us being able to cooperate together and make this all happen was phenomenal. I mean, it really was. This is a tough site. No one thought that we could get six lots out of the site. No, I mean, it was, it was, uh, that's what held up the sale for a long time was not enough lots. And so we were able to come up with a plan to do it and the plan to do it all the way down to changing um, this plan. I think it was on Monday. I revised this and, and gave it back to the city um, showing the 34 feet and then tapering down to right here at the center line of this private driveway to 28 feet but allowing tax lot 2900 all the way up through to, I don't know what the name of what this tax lot is up here. 2900 is down here. Um, we get the 34 foot. Uh, yeah. The whole, um, I think it's 46 foot right away. Um, and a 30 foot four curb to curb section with a sidewalk going into tax lot 3000. And I looked at tax lot 3000 today because uh, Kurt McLeod and I were talking about um, how Adams Street was going to align with Jefferson. Jefferson and Adams had a conflict in their political careers. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm looking at Adams Street today and I'm going, well, the conflict is again with what I did was I came around here with a hundred foot um, center line curve to go up into tax lot 3000. Well, Adams has a similar situation. You're going to have to put a hundred foot curve at the end of Adams Street in order to get it out away from the Western property line in order to be able to get lots um, along the, the Western boundary line. So, it's a win-win for everybody, I think. It'll help tax lot 3,000 when they develop in the future to actually develop. And you're going to get, these are going to be beautiful little houses. I mean, it's up on the hill. It's called Jefferson Heights because it is at the top of the hill. And there's going to be some nice views from up there. Um, two car garages. Uh, the... Base of the garage will be 20 feet away from the easement. So it's a typical house with typical setback from the easement. Um, decent backyards. We're dealing with the stormwater. Uh, according to the city engineer, we're extending the sanitary sewer all the way to the northern property line, the water line, the northern property line. Um, I, I, it's just a, I think it's a win for the city to be able to get rid of the property. It's a win for the developers developing the property. Um, the fence issue, uh, I gotta bring that up. And have we, have we dealt with that one tax lot that has built their landscaping onto this property? Has that been dealt with? Do we know? There was a parcel, this parcel it's being pointed at right here. Um, they landscaped into our parcel by about 20 feet. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that that's been dealt with or not. It's been dealt with. Okay, it's been dealt with. Um, but the fence issue. Uh, I don't know how to fence the western side of the right of way that we're dedicating and down the easement. I just, fencing along here, fencing along here is gonna be very, it's gonna be very difficult. How do you fence a roadway? And you're saying, what you're saying is, as I look at this, you're talking about the Western half of this road up in here. Um, we're only required to fence our, our boundary line, but how do we fence down our boundary line goes down the middle of the pavement. Can you turn so I can see where you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Our, our, our boundary line is here. Correct. 
our edutainment or curb is here. And where is the fence required according to the bill of sale? Down the boundary line. Yeah, okay. okay. On Jefferson. On Jefferson. Yeah. So it'd be, Jefferson like, it'd be like in the middle of the road. Well, and I, and I, 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 what the language says, the condition of approval 25 on page 31 is that the fence uh, feet high shall be installed on the side and back yards of the property in accordance with the agreement. And oh, I know I've got an electronic copy of the agreement. I don't know if I've got it in the file folder here, but. You know, I could see us doing your normal family fence along uh, the property line of our new parcel at our. Yeah, that's and I, that's and that's what I'm thinking that you know it, that the, the the way the language is written, it's like, hey, this person wanted it when it's sold. It sounds like they wanted it sold, such that there would be fencing between whatever was there at the time it was written. They may have thought it would have been one single lot that was developed single house on it, just fence the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Never had the concept that there could be four, three, six other lots. So it makes more sense that the interpretation could simply be, you got six parcels, you got six individual lots, those six lots need to be fenced in what you would call the standard ordinary manner for side yard, side well, yard the city, the city standards. I mean, you have, you have standards, you can't, Put a six foot fence all the way to this this easement. No, you can't. That's not we we yeah, that, that's where it's like what was written at one point in time has to make sense with what's gonna happen today. Yeah, so that's, so to the front of the house, yes, you can have a six foot fence, but you have to keep side triangles. Yeah, you keep your side triangles, but other than that, it's like you got your rear fence, you got your side yard fences. Whether you have the fences going to the front yard, that's you know, that, what is. So, so does that also uh, this I am I'm going down here. This is other law. I feel like I'm over here, like this house. house. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. Okay, he's saying they're deliberating. They're working about fence coming down. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't think that's your chair. Yes. The administrator has brought a copy of the July 26, 2022. Purchase and sale agreement with earnest money. And so I enter it into the record. Yes. And on page five, uh, no, here it is. Page five, uh, section five is conditions to closing. And then section 5.1 III, buyers. <laughs> The commitment to install a site obscuring fence at the time of housing development on side and backyards as a buffer to adjacent residential zones. So I think in terms of meeting that condition, it's a buyer's submission of a written commitment. Presumably the buyer did submit the written commitment and is in the closing documents. And so then they have committed to installing the site obscuring fence at the time of housing development. So this is anticipating residential development yes. on side and backyards. And it doesn't say of oh, proposed lots because who knows yeah. exactly what kind of development might have gone here. But I would think that a decision by the planning commission could anticipate that when a subdivision was proposed with six lots where they are proposed to be located that this would have anticipated having a fence on the side and backyard of the proposed lots that's not on the side and back of the original subject property. That's that's what that's what I was saying. Because that <laughs> western that part fun. of the subject property is being dedicated to the public for right of yeah, way. That's, that's 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 what I was getting at, Jim. Is that it would so, be the individual lots would have side and rear rear yard fencing on them. So six lots and appropriate fencing. So can we somehow verbalize that in the condition? Yeah, we can change. Thank you, Brandon. And 
just kind of getting into the nitty gritty, but just so that you can see what I think your intent would be. Condition of approval 25 would be something, and we can discuss the exact language during deliberation, but a minimum six foot high fence shall be installed on the side and backyards of the. No, no, uh, that makes sense. Said parcels one through six. Yeah, so I mean, that would mean every parcel side and back, right? Not just the side and back around the right, perimeter. Right. Yeah, it would be side and rear fencing on each individual lot. Subject to so, uh, subject to our fencing criteria. Yeah. Yes. Right. So is that okay on yeah, the, the side yeah. and back of each create, lot? Create each each created lot. Okay. Yep. Yeah, if that's okay with the applicant, then legally created lot. Yes. So yeah, that's yeah. You had a question, Chris. You answered it, but I guess my other question for you is, are you just gonna, some developers will just fence the entire lots, I guess, before you, or is your plan to just fence them all the way out? It's almost fenced, or are you, you just wanna, gonna fence the build, edge? They wanna build the homes. We wanna build the homes. Just, to, I'm just, it's just out of curiosity. And I agree with your assessment of that. that and they will probably project. fence every lot. Yeah. Build the homes, fence each lot, yeah. And what's our city offset for from sidewalk? Is it six feet? The fence has to be offset from the sidewalk to it can't be built right up against the sidewalk. Uh, our the Lafayette zone code does not require fences to be uh, offset from a sidewalk. It just requires that they be on private property. And in this case, <clears throat> the and you can kind of see it on page three of the addendum. The, well, I guess the sidewalk is shown next to the east right of newly dedicated right of way line. Jim, so I have a half foot between the back sidewalk and the property line. Oh, okay. Because I, I don't like to. In mm -hmm. okay. okay, right at the sidewalk. Yeah, so it looks like there's going to be a half foot between the property line and the edge of the sidewalk. Okay, the reason I'm asking that we can talk about in deliberation is there's developments, current developments now where they're requiring fences were being put closer to the sidewalk, and mm -hmm. the developer was told by somebody with the city, nope, they have to be six feet. So if you drive through the new whole subdivision, all those fences are set six to eight feet from the sidewalk. They, the they had to rip out the fences and redo it. Is that here in Lafayette? That's in Lafayette. That's in the whole subdivision if you drive through there. So my concern is, and I don't want you to run into sort its of developer if all of a sudden that pops up because that's going to change the size of your lot. It's going to eat into your backyard, your lots and everything. So I, the reason I'm bringing it up and I want that to be a surprise and that maybe something staff needs to look at. Was you that were the major developer to do it. I'm concerned it's going to happen. And so was that a situation where the right of way was whatever width and then the two trees, curb gutter and sidewalk didn't take up the entire width of the right? This of is way? a, uh, if you drive through there's a normal subdivision with your normal size streets, with your normal size sidewalks. And then from the sidewalk in the, you have the property line, there's a sidewalk, which includes the easement. And then there, the fence has to be built six feet. Sidewalk in, but yet the house can be built five foot from the edge of the right away. No, it's we can discuss it later. Also, I can, yeah. it, you might it would, it, would be, it, would, it would be something. Yeah, it would be something to look into because I there, don't want is to there. Be, yeah, is there a unique situation in that subdivision yeah. where the right of way? Because it happens, and Jim, it yeah. will happen where that right of way is actually six feet into the yard, even though it's just on yeah. grass. It's still right of way, so you can't build in that. We've had a few things like that turn up here, where the road is only built twenty feet wide. But the right of way is 50 feet. Yep. So you got, you know, X number of feet that's undeveloped. Now people are putting a fence up because that's where the grass kind of naturally ends. But mm -hmm. oh buddy, you're 10 feet into the right of way mm. that you didn't know about. That you know <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a, the information is available, but you gotta go right. come get it. It's just some 
discussion okay, so that we'll, staff did approach that. We'll circle back. Or, we'll circle, these folks keep that mind. We'll circle back them. around to that. And I can't imagine Bill didn't know if it was in CC ours. It's not. They built their own CC. It's whole. They built their own CCNRs and they had everything built and somebody with the city approached them and said, you got to move it. And it okay. cost them thousands of dollars. So, so sorry for that. Yeah. 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 So look, that was him for that. So I can't take the blame. Yeah. Or the, <laughs> uh, so there's no problem. Yeah. Oh, no, no. It, it, that was, no th 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 this is the whole point in time to bring these things up. So yeah. we get to get a solution. Okay. We'll look at it. Uh, let's see. Okay, we've heard from the applicant. You're going to be. Uh, yeah. And support and supporters. Any any testimony that the that people are here in support of this project that they would like to speak or you know, give? Thank you. No comments from supporters. Okay, well we'll move on to opponents. Anybody in the audience opposed to this particular subdivision? Would you like to come and speak? Apparently nobody's opposed. Drats. I like opposition because then we can come up with a better solution. Okay. Uh, is there anybody here that is neither for nor against this that would like to speak on behalf of something? <laughs> and again, resounding silence. Okay. Now. You've got the purchase agreement into the record, Jim. So we've got that piece taken care of. Question with regard to fence versus sidewalk versus setback. So that will be that will be, can be looked at and, and looked at and clarified. Yes, Chair. Thank you. And and find out and 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 since he, we've got an example of somebody being told something needs to move, the idea would be find out what the conditions are for this particular property compared to the other property so that one has a clear answer so that there, a person can act to say, yes, it's this way over here, here's why. It's this way over here, here's why. Sure, but may I can yes. clarify that. The fence standard was changed last June. So the action you're referring to was back in the, the previous January. Mm -hmm. So the previous standards that, that you're referring to were for whole homes where you could not have a, a fence above three and a half feet within 10 feet of a property line. The Planning Commission then recommended the change and the council approved a, an amendment in uh, July of, or June of last year to allow a full six foot on the property. Excellent, good. So no surprises. Okay. 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 That point is clarified. So. Is anybody going to be terribly unhappy if I close the hearing? Okay, then I shall close the hearing. And we can enter deliberation if one so chooses. Comments, questions? I know. Uh... Opposition. So I think I really appreciate the fact the developer has looked at the future and getting those two streets eventually together for that future lot development to the north. Um, so that I think they've taken into consideration what's best for the city. Well, that and, and 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 then being able to put six lots in there, being able to develop, basically being able to put a development in there that seems to fit with the piece of property is the best, that's the best way I can describe it. The only question I have is the fire lane, you know, as far as access, because most um, people- he, he made the comment that, 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 that the comment was made that if you were to look at the- I understand what They can said. pull up and back in, or they can pull in and do, and, and back out. So they have- And that's and, great, and, and people are, are using their on start, on, site parking, but if you park in the street, there isn't a whole lot of room. I mean, how many people do you know? That are well, going you, to do that, you do it, you do have a pro you do have close. a you do have a yeah, it's called in the staff report and it's in the city engineers comments also, one of the options supported to the applicant was to have a 28 foot curve to curb. Okay. That means in the 
to back up. The Oregon Fire Code requires a minimum 20 foot clear area. That's why whenever you have a, an access easement or a, okay. whatever, you gotta have a minimum of 20 feet. And so the applicant is proposing once you get north of the stubbed Jefferson Street, then it's 28 foot improvement. That leaves 20 feet for two travel lanes. Okay. And eight feet for parallel parking. This little easement that runs off to the east will have to be uh, posted or red curbed, no parking because it's only 25 feet. Okay, that, that's that's so crazy. these people will have no so-called on-street parking because they don't have a public street. They've only got a private one access. foot wide paved surface for two travel lanes to go in and out. Okay, that, that, that answered my question. They don't have a two-car garage, and then I'm assuming in front of those garages, you're going to have two parking spots in front of them. Yeah, have four parking spaces off the street for each property. Okay, that's that's that into any guests come, they're going to all have to probably be on the garage side. In some but, houses, when the guests come, all the stuff stored in the garage would have to be somewhere <laughs> else in the backyard. <laughs> so that so that stub street though is a private street, correct? It's not a, not enforceable by our code officer right. for any kind yeah, of parking that's violation. Private property with an easement over it, and one of the conditions of approval is that there. You know, be a crossover easement, so to speak, and a maintenance agreement. So these six properties will be responsible to maintain their 20 foot paved driveway on their properties. So is that, is there, and maybe I missed it somewhere, is there, is there a planned HOA or association yeah, be an property to so control that where there'll be CCNRs? Yeah. Okay. So that answers the fire lane question for enforcement. It would be self control Okay. Well, I guess we've got our questions answered. A lot of the questions then basically are not for us. They're more on the building side and for city planning and planning permits, et cetera. They'll take care of that angle of things. But for us, it's a motion. And I think I will go with, um, I'll make a motion. To approve the application, adopting the finding conditions contained in the SAP report, with further clarification over point 25 regarding fencing, and the sales contract agreement that ties into that. Okay, and so just, just, a, just a minor add a line or two that clarifies yeah. that it would be normal fencing for to provide a little more flesh to that. Change to 25, uh, something to the effect of a minimum six foot high fence shall be installed on the side and backyards of each lot one through six in accordance with the agreement and the Lafayette Zoning and Development Ordinance fence standards. Perfect. Perfect. I second that motion. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion passes. That's it for that public hearing. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was pretty famous. That was my favorite. Well, they, they, they're all here. <laughs> you guys did a good job. Good meeting. Good meeting. Um, we have any old business, Jim? Uh, I'm aware of, unless any of the commissioners have something working in the back of their mind from days, months ago. <laughs> it was more than yesterday. No, it's long gone in my brain. Um, New business. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Ed. Ed, good to see you. Love you, man. We'll be in touch. Uh,
do business, um, nothing, well, next month you will have a meeting. Um, there's been a similar use application turned in where in the, uh, and I don't need to say a whole lot about this because it's a quasi judicial thing, but yeah, okay, just so that you kind of have the concept in mind. The uh, red zoned area up there, the C1, the commercial core district, kind of our downtown district where the district allows primarily resident or retail and office and personal services, business services, those kinds of things. Uh, it also allows, if you have commercial on the first floor, uh, residential could be on the second floor. Okay. And a property owner has a proposed project or a concept, I guess you'd say, uh, that would have commercial on the first floor, residential on the second floor. But the issue that you will be asked to determine is the nature and how is the commercial on the first floor configured. I guess that's kind of not giving you a real solid bone to chew on, but at least that's the general idea of, of what will be on the agenda for next month. And you'll have the staff report a week ahead of time as usual, and we'll make it very clear in the staff report what the bone of contention is that the applicant is asking about. Okay. So then I guess next meeting, March 16th. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I have a motion to adjourn today's meeting. I second I that. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nice meeting you, Chris. Welcome aboard. <laughs> you know, hopefully you realize what you get yourself into. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I should have brought up our thing, and I did make a meeting. Mike, the other Mike, March 16th. Yeah, going to the 